Should I take off my camera? Oh, we're going to leave on the camera. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want the door behind you open or closed? Or does it not matter? It doesn't matter to me. Does it matter to you? Um, why don't you close it? Okay. <laughs> I, too, am in an Airbnb. So <laughs> even parallels there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ready. Let's do it. Three, okay. two, one. Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today I'm very excited to have Dr. Francis Yahia with us. Francis is an author, mental health counselor, Akashic Records reader, archetypal astrologer, podcast host, and college professor. She uses universal laws, metaphysics, mythology, and astrology to create theories and therapeutic tools to help clients hear subconscious wounds. Francis weaves universal truths and ancient stories together to help clients explain the story they're living in in their own life. She's the author of the book, Own Your... Oh, no. Wait a second. Uh, Own Your Story, Own Your Life. Is, is that the name of a book or is that just... No, no. The book is The Seven Gates, Seven self on Self-Awareness. Okay. She's also author of the... She's author of the book, The Seven Gates. Oh, shoot. Uh, that's not in your bio, so let me... The Seven Gates, and then there's another book. Uh, it's as The well. Seven Gates, Seven Steps Beyond Self Awareness and Witch Bitch Ceremonies and Rituals for Gods and Goddesses. Okay. I'll, I'll just, <laughs> for simplicity, because we're recording now, uh, I'm just, and we'll edit this out, but I'll, I'll just mention you know what? Let's just go with what we got so far. <laughs> okay. okay. Here we go. Francis, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you. It's such a great, great being here. So you were on my wife's podcast on Stellar Life, and I listened to the episode, and it was phenomenal. And so I've got plenty of material to go over with you uh, where I wanted to go on some different uh, paths. But let's start, first of all, for our listener who's not aware of the Akashic Records. What are the Akashic Records? I know there was an episode last year where I interviewed an Akashic Records reader, Anne-Marie Pizarro, but not everybody who's listening has heard that episode. So what are the Akashic Records? So the word Akash is actually a Sanskrit word meaning space or ether. And the idea is that everything in the universe is surrounded by this one energy field that holds everything past, present, and future. So through a prayer, I can access the Akashic records and each individual person or soul has their own Akashic records. So we can ask any questions about past, present or future in the Akashic records. Um, if you understand the makeup of the universe, there's seven planes. Humans are only allowed access because of the density of our body to the, the four lower planes. The highest of those four is the Akash or the Akashic records or the Akashic planes. So it's sort of like the peer-reviewed article, if you will, of this of the spirit world. So only four do we have access to. Uh, why is it that we only have access to four? Because the density of our body. So in every philosophy, religion, or tradition, everything starts. The makeup of the world that we know starts at the akash, then goes to the air element, then goes to fire then goes to water, then goes to earth. So it's the way that our body is made up. If we look at the chakras, the fifth chakra is the Akash. When the Bible, when they say the word was spoken and the word was God, that's the Akash. In Sankhya philosophy that rules Ayurveda and Hindu or Vedic philosophy, again, it's all about the Akash. So all we have access to are those lower levels, and that's the highest level that we have access to. Okay. So for, for our listener who... Uh, is not aware of metaphysics and maybe Hinduism and chakras and Ayurveda and uh, Kabbalah, perhaps. And they're trying to figure out, like, where does all this fit in? They understand the, maybe the Bible, uh, but this goes well beyond uh, the Bible. How does this all fit in together? Because it does, right? There, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's the universal truth. And then there are these different traditions, different religions, different dogmas, and uh, uh, spiritual practices. 
Great question. So one of the things I like to say in the metaphysics college that I run, that's sort of my tagline, is universal truths for modern day application. So I personally use eight metaphysical or universal truths to rule everything in my life. These, I believe, are the overriding laws that override the universe. Our age and the cycles that we go through, whether it's developmental, whether it's a business cycle, everything in the universe is dictated by these universal laws. We're held to these laws, whether we know them or not. So better to know them. Um, in terms of religion, traditions, philosophies, spiritual practices, they're all obligated to abide by those laws. And every single book, in essence, even the book like the Bible, is a metaphysical text. It's just been written in a secretive way to not identify that all the spiritual traditions are saying the same thing. So, for instance, the Bible is a mythological text. It's a metaphysical text. Yes, there's some historical accounts of Jesus and whatnot. But if you break it down, you'll find all of the universal laws in there. And you'll find that every single religion and tradition is saying the exact same thing when you really strip it down. And that is to bring it back to those universal laws. So spiritual practices fall in to those universal laws. Um, I like starter kit spirituality, which is sort of providing clients the basics, the 12 steps to a spiritual practice, and then finding out where their current spiritual practices fit into those steps and then weaving in to complete the practice with you know, practical applications so that they can actually hit on all 12 steps of a spiritual practice that in essence, every spiritual tradition speaks to. Okay, so let's start with, oh, we're getting some feedback. Let's start with the eight truths, and then we'll get to the 12 steps. So can, you, can we go through the, what the eight truths are? Okay, so there's, there's eight principles and one law. So there is a wonderful text that it's free online. It's called the Kabbalion, and the Kabbalion has these seven principles. The first principle is the principle of mentalism, and it basically states that all is mind. Every single thing created in the universe is mental. It's very hard for humans to grasp. So I like to actually start with law of gender. And let me explain. The other laws, the other principles are actually part of all is mind. All in mind is sort of the umbrella, kind of like the Akashic Records. So the energy field is all is mind. It's the principle of mentalism. And all the others are sort of components of and build up to that. But so all is would mind a, is would very... Accurate, yeah. uh, would it be accurate to say that um, everything is co-created with the creator by our focus and our belief systems. And so we create our own reality, something like that. that is, is that's absolutely true. Yes, all of us create our reality. That's exactly what the law says, is it all is mind. And so all of the other laws fall into play. For instance, the law of correspondence, as within, so without falls into play. So whatever's happening on the external is related to your internal, which was created by your subconscious mind. And I need to say that in, in one of the books that I'm writing now, it's not about co-creating, manifesting, or affirming, or visualizing from the conscious mind. This is all subconscious. Your subconscious mind was gifted to you by your parents their low level of consciousness at the moment of creation. Some believe, as do I, that it's from karmic patterns from past lives. But even if you don't believe in karma and past lives, at the moment of conception, you were given your subconscious mind based on your parents and their level of consciousness. You've created your world from that level of consciousness up until the moment that you decide to change it. That's what those words refer to. It's not a conscious decision to make a vision board or a visualization or affirmation you've got to change your subconscious thoughts or you change nothing wow okay we're gonna have to we're gonna have to get to that in in uh some more detail but first let's go through the rest of those principles okay so mentalism that's number one yes the second is the principle of correspondence and it states as within so without 
as above, so below. So correspondence is what some of us term as synchronicity. If something's happening outside, where is this a mirror to what's happening inside? So there is no coincidence. It relates to this universal principle. As above, so below relates to everything that's happening in our planes, the planes we have access to, the Akashic and, and lower, is actually happening in the higher planes as well, even though we don't have access to seeing them. So nothing is a coincidence. Everything is divinely guided and everything is a message. When I teach the Akashic Records, one of the laws or the rules is respond to all information given. And this is like the hardest part for students to grasp. They'll ask a question in the records, they'll get an answer and they'll stay there. It's like we're afraid to get any more detail as if guidance is gonna get angry. And we wanna respond to everything that's given because there's more. So when you see something in your life, respond to that question, where is that showing up in my life? Or where do I create this? Or what is this trying to teach me? I'll be walking through Walgreens and there'll be three people that are in my way. Okay, what is this trying to teach me? Perhaps to slow down, perhaps to be more patient. Everything is guidance. There is not one moment of the universe that is wasted to not provide guidance. We just haven't been trained to, to be that observant. Right, so let's, so let's go through a quick example. Um, I have uh, uh, recently traveled from Israel, now in Florida, and I made a little boo-boo and managed to misplace my son's passport. It's back in uh, the airport, Ben Gurion Airport, and uh, the United Representatives have it. I need to somehow get it from Israel <laughs> back over here, and. I know there's a message here and there's a lesson to be learned. Uh, but for somebody who just maybe heard this for the first time that uh, I had managed to leave my son's passport behind, uh, they might be scratching their head wondering, like, how can that be a message or a lesson or uh, something that was divinely guided? So great question. So the language of the universe is symbol, metaphor, and myth. And not everybody lives in symbol, metaphor, and myth like I do. So I create like worksheets and, and workbooks that are available on my website for people to have some guidance. But I'll give you an example. I can look at it from a metaphorical, symbolic point of view that the country of Israel um, can be the country which represents the moon, which represents the mother. Or I can ask you a question. What didn't you like about leaving your son's passport in the airport? I didn't like having so much uh, in my head to have to remember and keep track of. And it felt like I was uh, losing um, things through the cracks. And, 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 and this isn't just metaphorical because not only did I misplaced his passport. The gate agent managed to still hold on to it. But one of our suitcases, the zipper burst open, and I don't know what, if anything, spilled out. But when we picked it up uh, in, in the States, it had uh, some da damage, and uh, it was partially open. So... <laughs> Not only am I losing track of st things that are kind of bursting at the seams figuratively and literally in terms of the luggage. Okay, so the question, the second question I asked, if you don't have sort of archetypal or symbolic or metaphorical sort of knowledge, is what simple question, what don't I like about this situation? That's a mirroring technique. That is the law of correspondence. So you said that things are falling, you know, through the cracks or that you're, uh, there's too much to keep track of. So perhaps you're overscheduled, for instance. Perhaps there's something in your life that's time to detach from and let go. And we know that detachment and surrender is a spiritual principle. So what could you detach from? And, and, and physically, you've got luggage. So physically, you can start the detachment process. You can maybe get rid of some clothing, or you can get rid of some of the knickknacks that you no longer need for your move. 
but where can you do that internally? And of course, it always brings you back to all is mind. What thoughts are time to let go of? So we kind of eventually always come back to the subconscious thoughts. And I bring up the moon and the mother country because at the end of the day, it's all about mother and father. I call them the rulers of the kingdom. What I call the loyals of the royals. And we are loyal to these royals. And until we dethrone our parents in our subconscious mind and assume our own kingdom, we really do not create the life that we're intended to create, that the creator has given our lifetime to mean and find our purpose. Okay. We'll have to... We can unpack that. Yeah, we can unpack that later. And literally. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. But let's get through the rest of the seven principles. So that was a really powerful one, the correspondence. And by the way, I just recently learned that synchronicity is a uh, term that was coined by Carl Jung. And I know you're a big fan of Carl Jung. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious uh, what uh, your thoughts are on uh, Jungian uh, psychology and how that ties in to all, all the stuff that we're all, all the spiritual stuff we're talking about. Oh, absolutely. So my PhD is in mental health and I am a licensed mental health counselor. And at the university, I'm the program director of the psychology department. And I'm actually training my students to be depth psychologists, which is what Jung is known for. So I'm, they're sort of metaphysicians in training. Now, Carl Jung was a psychiatrist. However, he was an astrologer and he was a metaphysician. And he just didn't want that to be the label. He wanted to be known for his science of his of his psychiatric uh, studies. But he actually was an astrologer and a metaphysician. And that's where he gets all of his information from. And that's why his teachings align with mine. And he was also um, a mythologist, just like me. So you'll see a lot of overlap in people that and study depth psychology, metaphysics, astrology, Akashic records, because it's all sort of the same vein. But it all relates back to these universal laws. Okay. And these are just tools. Astrology, Akashic records is just law, uh, tools to show that these laws exist. Gotcha. Okay. So next uh, in the set of principles is what? Is the principle of vibration. So everything is at vib uh, is vibrating, nothing is at rest. So um, there's a concept in intuitive arts that's called psychometry, where you can pick up a cup or you can pick up a, a recorder or a pen and you can get a message. So if you go into a store to buy a crystal and you're reading the vibration, everything has a, has a vibration, nothing, nothing rests. Now, this goes back to the elements. The denser the elements, the denser the vibration, the less the vibratory sort of mechanism, if you will. The higher the vibration, the more it vibrates. So when we talk about raise your vibration or eating certain foods to raise your vibration, that's what it's referring to. So prana, for instance, in food, the sort of life force or the chi has a higher vibration if it's healthy or organic um, foods. However, I have to preface, it all goes back to all is mind. If your thoughts are at a low vibration, at the same vibration at the moment of conception, eating gluten-free and organic foods and $10 juices, you're wasting your time. <laughs> it really is about changing the vibration of your thoughts and everything else comes after. And in my starter kit spirituality, when I go through it, the diet and the exercise isn't until the sixth step. The first step is the mental. Wow. wow. So I just wow. recently I just came to the I just recently came to the realization that I should be blessing my food and drink before I consume it. I had never really done that uh, my whole life and, until this year. I mean just on a rare occasion. And it came to like I've had some spiritual epiphanies uh, very powerful ones this year. And that's something that came to me intuitively that I needed to do this. I didn't need to. I wanted to because I, I want the benefits. And it's more than just uh, gratitude and, right. and, and appreciation to the creator. It actually transforms what you're consuming. Any thoughts it absolutely on that? does. 
Dr. Emoto, um, and you can Google his fantastic videos on what the thought process on water molecules does to those water molecules. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, and yes, um, our thoughts, our prayers, um, whether it's gratitude or just the blessing of thank you over our food shifts that structure. Um, and that is, again, the vibration of the food shift. So if you can access a McDonald's, you know, chicken McNugget and pray over it, you're actually shifting the vibration. A lot of people are worried, as they should be, with the food production in this country and the slaughter of animals and how they're mistreated. So if you don't have control over that because perhaps limited finances or limited resources, you can actually take this proactive step and bless your food. Um, and that really helps to shift the vibration. Again, at the end of the day, the vibration has to do with the level of your thoughts. That's the first step of any spiritual practice. We have to revisit this over and over and over again. Most people don't even know the quality of thoughts, what they're thinking and how they're creating the world they live in, both in their own mind, uh, in their own home, but even in the greater world from a social justice perspective, for instance, we have created everything that's happening from past, present and future. All of that energy stored in the records. That's that's what I was saying before the law of correspondence as above, so below. What we're seeing happening now in our world, all of the crisis that we're in is reflective of what we've created with our mind throughout the centuries that's stored in the records. Nothing's accidental. Right. All right. <clears throat> so, so uh, uh, one of my Kabbalah uh, teachers, uh, he uh, told me that he had gotten vaccinated, but he uh, did some prayers uh, and it transmuted the, the vaccine as it was being injected because I, um, I was very concerned for him. You know, I, don't, uh, I, I, I consider the vaccine to be very experimental and uh, problematic and that, you know, it's, there's not been enough time to uh, conduct all the necessary uh, trials and, and so forth. And so I don't want to be a guinea pig. Um, and I, yeah, was surprised to hear what he had described. Describe. And I thought, okay, that's, that's interesting. But what about the science of this experimental uh, substance that you accepted? Like, you can pray over But then... Over time, I, I I think mind really is over matter. It's mind over matter, and you can transmute anything. So there's a few things there. So I myself had cancer three times, and I work with cancer patients. And before chemotherapy, which is a lot of people view as toxic, we do a lot of this um, changing of the energy, the vibration, so that the body takes the chemotherapy as medicine rather than as poison. So I myself have in my own body practiced this and haven't had such severe results of the chemotherapy in terms of days and days and weeks of sickness. Um, so that practice actually does work. I can speak to that personally. And I do work with clients in that. Wow. I also like to refer to the word transformation versus transmutation. And this is super important. And it links back to the law of octaves, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. But transformation is when you make a change in your thoughts that isn't yours yet. You're on the way to changing vibration. You're on your way to becoming a higher level of consciousness than your parents at the moment of conception. But you still don't own that behavior. Transmutation is when it's your behavior. So I used to bite my nails as a little girl. I no longer bite my nails. I've transmuted. That behavior has gone higher level of consciousness. But if I'm still in the process of thinking, taking a step, do I make this choice? Is this good for me? That's transformation. So that's why he used transmutation, because he owned that thought change about the vaccine. Yeah, so it's yeah, beyond so just... Yeah. It's beyond just faith. It's it's certainty. It's it's uh, absolute conviction that it's real and that it's uh, doing the thing that you're you're envisioning. 
Well, it's the conviction that your thought has changed around it. So these are universal truths because they're truths. So I have a saying, it's not your truth. It's the truth. The truth are the universal laws. Everything else is just your truth. So when he owned the truth that this vaccine would no longer harm him, he transmuted a low level vibration of the of his truth to the truth, understanding that everything in the universe is as it should be. Again, all is mind. He changed his mind. He changed his thought. He changed the response to the vaccine in his body. We don't realize how much agency we have and how much control we have. Um, you know, Buddha said, a pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Humans love to suffer. I know that that's like, people don't like to hear that, but we really love to make love to our problems and suffer, hold on to our suffering and our story. We have to have pain because we're in the human body. Call it karma, call it flesh, whatever. But it's the, the suffering that's optional. And that's always attached to a thought that hasn't been analyzed. And that's why all is mind or control of your thoughts is always the first step in a spiritual practice. Mm. This is powerful stuff. This okay, let's keep stuff. going through the principles. <laughs> sure. Next is principle of polarity. Okay, so principle of polarity and principle of rhythm are the next two, and I'm going to kind of join them. And again, all of these are built into all the others linked back to all is mind. So principle of polarity is that everything has poles, what I call in my language, zero to 100. Okay. So when I observe behavior, or I speak to a client, I'm listening to what they're saying as much as to what they're not saying. This is the zero to 100. I want to be so courageous because I'm so fearful. I show up ultra courageous, 100, or I show up so fearful, zero. The truth is in the middle. And the law states all truths are but half truths. The way we live out our truths are half truths. The truth is the 48 to 52, what I call it. It's been called the golden mean, the yin yang, the path, the way, the Tao. And it's also known as equanimity. Equanimity is when you can take the zero to 100, the extremes of your behavior and your thoughts and find the midpoint. When you can discover that midpoint, then you actually have a spiritual path to guide you for the rest of your life. This is an extremely powerful law. A lot of my theories and books are built on this law for this purpose. So I talk a lot about the 48 to 52. And in practice, just to give your readers some practical, it's usually the midpoint between what your mother and your father showed you and told you, because your parents were simply mirrors of one another. Your mother had perhaps an overt power currency. Your father had a covert. Well, the midpoint is the truth. And in my first book, The Seven Gates, um, Seven Self Steps Beyond Self-Awareness, I talk about this in terms of buckets, good buckets and bad buckets. We all have good qualities and bad qualities that we deem good and bad. The truth is somewhere in the middle. This practice is ridiculously powerful. So sometimes when I ask clients, to give me a word for their zero and a word for their hundred, once we identify what that is, I'll ask them a word for the 48 to 52. And a lot of times I'll be like, well, that's so boring. And that's what all the spiritual literature says. You're not gonna have high highs and you're not gonna have low lows. You're gonna be at that midpoint. A lot of people going back to loving our drama and our problems don't want boring. They want excitement and chaos and drama. It's fine, but own that you created it. Own that you have agency and you're choosing those highs and lows because they make you feel good. It's not that anything is being done to you. It's almost like an addiction oh, to the highs and lows, to the, uh, the, the drama and chaos. Yes, and we all have them. So I have a video series on pain versus pleasure. Some of us are pain as pleasure and some of us are pleasure as pain. So for instance, I'm a pain as pleasure person. It's inherent in my sign of Pisces. I used to love to suffer, the drama, the victim, the rescuer until I identified that. So some people have a very hedonistic lifestyle. That's pleasure as pain. Either extreme is not good. So those people that are so pious for the wrong reasons, there are people that are obviously pious for the right reasons, but most of us aren't. Those people that are so pious, that's a zero to 100, just like someone who's an alcoholic. 
it, they're zero to 100. And the next law, which is the law of rhythm and, and ties into polarity is that these opposites meet. All opposites meet and everything is cyclical. The universe is cyclical and spherical. The universe has no hierarchy. And as humans, we don't understand that. So we think it's us versus them when simply it's just a circle. And our spiritual growth is cyclical and spherical. And you can see this in nature. There are no straight lines in nature. And nature actually has a number. It's called the Fibonacci number. And it grows in spiral. You can see it on the, the curves of a pineapple or a seashell. That's how our spiritual growth is. Every 12 years, we are gifted an amount, depending on our desires, um, how much work we've done internally, a spiritual, a spiritual growth pattern. So everybody is going to grow spiritually in this lifetime. You just decide if you want a small little piece of growth or if you want a big chunk of the growth. So those two hand, go hand in hand. Okay, so I want a big chunk of growth. How do I uh, ma manifest that and, and make that real? Do I have to figure out what's going on inside of my subconscious in order to make that uh, uh, choice, or, or can I just choose it? No, you can't choose it because choice is from the conscious mind, and nothing in the universe happens from the conscious mind. So to refer to Jung when he talks about the collective unconscious. Everything is in the collective unconscious. So our unconscious or subconscious is in our sort of sixth chakra in the back of our head, so to speak, um, ruled by the pituitary and in the in the universe as well as the collective unconscious. This is not a conscious choice. That's why visualizations, affirmations, vision boards really disappoint if you don't change the thought. So there's 12 basic steps to any spiritual path. The first one is analysis of thought, control of thought, control of speech, control of mind. You have to know the quality of your thoughts. You need to know the vibration of your thoughts and, and aim to raise a vibration. And again, on my website, I have all these tools as free workbooks and a few books coming out this year that will go even more in depth. And I have a ton of videos on my YouTube channel that explains all this. The eighth step in a spiritual practice is shadow work. The shadow work is going into the depths of your subconscious and really understand what you're creating, why you're creating it, the story, why you're holding on to it. Um, and it's really a fear of not having love. At the root of it, we were all given a dysfunctional language of love, a dis dysfunctional version of love during pregnancy. And that's what we're holding on to. And so we go through life sort of as a child in an adult body, trying to get our needs, un, uh, unmet needs met. And at the eighth step, once you start shadow work, you actually realize that you are supposed to meet your own needs. You learn to meet your own needs by observance of your thoughts and your shadow work. And then you can really continue on with the re rest of the steps, which is then to go out into humanity, if that's your calling, and help others. Prior to that, prior to step eight, you can't absolutely help anybody because you haven't even helped yourself yet. Wow, this is wow. profound this is stuff. Awesome. It must have taken you quite a while to get to the point where you have uh, absorbed and utilized and transmuted all of these amazing concepts that go back uh, millennia or even kind of forever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I grew up in a cult. Um, so my origin story is actually that of spirituality. And the cult, I would say, wasn't maybe a cult when I first grew up in it. Um, the leader of the cult went awry later on in life. Um, so I was lucky enough to have a really strong spiritual foundation rooted in these teachings. Um, and then I left, um, stumbled a bit around um, with some spiritual teachers that were not spiritual teachers called Busiris. Um, that's another important step. Step three in your spiritual progress is finding a teacher, but finding what I call a Nereus, not a Busiris. And this comes from a myth of Hercules. There's two types of teachers. Those that try to rob you of your power and those that try to help you find your power. So I consider myself a Nereus. Um, so we all need teachers on the path, you know, whether it's momentarily or someone we study with formally, you know, at a school um, and they help us along our way. 
Um, so once I understood that and I left the cult and realized that this was something I had stumbled upon myself, you mentioned Kabbalah earlier. Um, a famous quote in Kabbalah actually is what changed my life, um, which is there's no coercion in spirituality. It's from the Zohar. And when I read that, I had realized at that point that I had never known true spirituality. And that's when my real search began. Um, astrology and Akashic Records came into my life at that point. And then, of course, studying metaphysics and Ayurveda and Kabbalah and all the studies that I've had sort of built on that. And so I've made my life's work creating doable techniques and workbooks and nuggets so that people can actually live a spiritual path um, in the modern day, not checked into an ashram or, you know, running away from reality. We can do these steps in our day-to-day -day life and people are simply just always mirrors of that for us. So it's a beautiful place to be. I'll tell you that the transmutation process is really hard. Um, and I'd like to kind of give your listeners a little hint most times before we are going to transmute truly, we go through a severe grief process. Um, it could be creating, and I know this is difficult for some people to accept, but creating a death of a loved one, a divorce, an illness. In my case, it was cancer. I understand now that I created the cancer because I needed to grieve what my low vibration was, what my previous life had been, that I had created it took personal responsibility for that. And after that cancer, then I was able to transmute. And now I'm able to actually not only teach the teachings, but live the teachings, apply the teachings. And not unnecessarily do we go through certain grief processes because it's our attempt to raise our vibration and transmute. So grief is not a bad thing. Wow. So you're oh, able to walk the talk and not just talk the talk because you lived it and uh, got through the other side. Absolutely. And I hope that that's what I vibrate at and teach my students. I'm right alongside with you doing the work. As I ask of you, I ask of myself. Yeah. Powerful stuff. Okay. So yes. what are the rest of the principles? And I think there might be Three of them left, Three. is that right? Yeah, yeah. So the principle of cause and effect. So we know this is karma. Um, so there, in Greek mythology, there's a myth of the fates and there's three fates. And at the moment of conception, Clotho, the fate that weaves the fate of your life shows up at conception. And that's what I call the origin story or the creation myth. That is, the karma, if you will, is woven through every single thing in your life. You come with what is called stanchitta karma. It's karma of your past deeds from past lives, if you believe in that. And that's the baggage you come in this lifetime to work through. I say own your story, own your life, because your story is one. Your theme is one. Your karmic baggage is one. It really isn't that complicated once we boil it down to the one thread that's woven into everything we say we speak we show up as every single situation in our life refers back to that one moment of conception that one thread that's the karma in this lifetime that you come to work through that's the transmutation process if you can take that karma transform it initially with changing your thoughts and own it as transmutation, which is a higher vibration thought that you own, you've checked, you know, your karmic sort of duty in this life. However, you are also creating new karma in this lifetime. So that's to be determined in the future, but you are actually assigned your karmic baggage at this moment of conception when you're conceived at a low vibration. This is super important that the listeners understand. The level of consciousness that you conceive, your children, that you were conceived is a low vibration. Our only purpose is to transmute that to a high vibration. So as an astrologer, excuse me, I have the four levels of vibration um, on a workbook that you can see exactly how to transmute each level to the next level. So there's four levels of vibration. And even if you just shift it one, you've already gained consciousness in this lifetime. 
the changes are very small. Yeah, powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. And, and one thing that I learned actually from uh, Laurel Langmire, who was a past guest on this uh, podcast, she had told me that the level of consciousness when you're conceiving uh, your baby is extremely important. So kind of call in that uh, that soul, soul instead of just, uh, you know, kind of <laughs> being in the moment uh, as you would normally be. Like if you're consciously conceiving, that really makes a difference. Well, that's going to change the trajectory of that soul in this lifetime. Their story is going to be one of want, one of desire, one of love in the capacity that we can give our child love. I do not believe in unconditional love from one person to another. That's an inside job. However, when you're wanted, that soul comes into that sort of matrix as a wanted child. Most pregnancies are unwanted or unplanned. And that also has a vibrational consequence in our life and how we show up in the world. A lot of that zero to 100 I see is inadequacy, perfection, and the 48 to 52 would be sufficiency or being enough. And most of us don't know how to be enough. Mm. So yeah, the level of vibration at conception is extremely important. The soul actually chooses the vibration that that soul needs in order to um, to receive the vehicle from the parents. So if I need to uh, uh, con be conceived at a vibration A, let's say, and my goal and my purpose in life is to become a vibration B, then I choose A level parents and then transmute to a level B. So the soul is making that choice upon conception where the parents are in union. Okay. Okay. So you had said earlier that karma, if you believe in it, and then you went on to describe things. Well, karma, the law of cause and effect, is a universal law. You can't escape it. And no, you can't escape any of these. But it doesn't mean you believe in all of them. Yeah. So what happens if you don't believe in it? It's still, you're still obligated to lie. I said that earlier. Whether you know these laws or not, this is the cycle of the universe. These are the laws that you're being held to. So better to know them. It's just like if you go to Arkansas and it's illegal to kill a cat and you kill a cat and the cop stops you. You don't know the law. You can't escape it. Same thing with universal law. You're held to these laws no matter what. And what I was saying in reference to the karma, whether you believe in it, I was actually referring to past lives. If you don't believe in past lives that you've earned karma previous lifetimes, it's okay. At this moment, you've created karma in this lifetime that you still have to work through. So to clarify, that's what I meant. But very good point. You're held to the law regardless of your knowledge of it. So better to know it. And so if you are uh, believing that this is the only lifetime you've ever had and that you don't have past lifetimes, that reincarnation is not real, again, it seems like you're still having to work off the karma of those past lifetimes, even if you don't believe in them, I mean, you could not believe in God and you're still going to have, uh, that, that truth, that reality, uh, hit you in the face when you die in a, in a good way. <laughs> so <laughs> if, uh, someone doesn't believe if they're skeptical or even worse, they're cynical about this, what, what do you tell them? Well, this is where astrology is a really good um, sort of teacher. So the planet of karma in astrology is the planet Saturn. And we can agree that Saturn has rings around it. So Saturn is a limiting planet. It's got rings. We are limited, so to speak, by the rings. Our body represents, when we're given a body, represents karma. We're limited. Our spirit, the universal consciousness, is forced into a structure. And in mythology, Uranus, which is a universal consciousness, was castrated by Saturn, which is the body. So we're forced now to have this essence of who we are, that we all feel we're greater than this body, forced into this body. So every seven years, um, we have what I call skinny cows. And I use that reference from a story in the Bible. Um, Joseph was, um, he would explain dreams um, for the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh would have this dream about these fat cows being swallowed by these skinny cows. Skinny cows, and there are seven, seven fat, seven skinny. 
And that we can see that in astrology, but you don't need to know astrology. It's just the cycles of the universe. Again, if you don't know the law of rhythm. It doesn't matter. You're held to the law. So every seven years, and that's why I'd say from zero to seven, we are given our story. We're actually given a conception, but most people don't know their conception story. At pregnancy, you're given another layer of that subconscious story. You may not know it. At your birth, you may, you'll may you be given another layer of that subconscious. You may not know it, but you were there for zero to seven. You know what happened to you. That skinny cow at seven years repeats itself every seven years until the day you die. That's karma. So whatever you're happening at seven, at 14, at 21, at 28 is all woven from that moment of conception and that level of consciousness that your parents were at when they conceived you. The fat cows refers to Jupiter. In mythology, Uranus castrated by Saturn, the body, and avenged by Jupiter, which is actually God or the version of God in Greek mythology, the ruler of Olympus or the ruler of the heavens. So the fat cows, after you have your spiritual crisis, your karma at your seven year, five years later, you have a Jupiter cycle, which is the fat cow. You get sort of recompense for the hard work you did. So you don't need to believe in karma. It's the cycle that you're going to on schedule every five to seven years, have a skinny cow. And it's all related to the moment of conception. And again, if you don't know your conception, pregnancy, or birth story, you know what happened to you at zero to seven, and that will be woven through every seven year cycles. I'd like to even add that there's two types of karma within these Saturn cycles. They're the ones that happen every 14 years, which is when you're supposed to evaluate your values that you were given in, in childhood. And every seven years, you have what's called a neutralizer, which is a person, a place, a thing, or a situation that actually comes to nudge you and say, hey, you're doing it wrong. Change your path. You're on a zero to 100, and this neutralizer comes in to say, hey, find the balance, find the balance. We call it karma. We call it crisis. We call it grief. It's universally guided for our growth, for that next fat cow, which is spherical and circular, for us to grow and get a bigger piece of the spiritual pie. Mm. Wow. Okay. Wow. So, so uh, uh, how many more principles do we have left? <laughs> there's two. We briefly okay. touched on law of gender, but I mean, uh, law of octaves. The principle of gender. So in my belief system, the all is mine concept, which really is the overriding one that all these others are sort of mixed into, is really impossible for humans to understand. Everything, like I said, in the universe is cyclical and spherical. So the seasons, the astrology wheel, the process of alchemy, the medicine wheel and shamanism is all circular. We don't see this this way. We don't understand the circle. We live in hierarchy. So the law of gender is sort of the visual, if you will, of hierarchy. And it's probably the one that we most understand that's most logical to us because we can see masculine and feminine polarity in everything we do. We can see it in our bedroom. We can see it in our children. We can see it in our mannerisms. We can see it in our work behaviors. So the law of gender is actually related to the sixth chakra. I have a great video series on my YouTube on these laws linked to fairy tales, and I link it to Mulan which she is this warrior in a man's world as a female, and she's unifying the masculine and feminine principles. We get this at the moment of conception. It does not matter the masculine feminine. It does not have anything to do with gender or sexuality. It has to do with an elemental principle. Do you have a lot of fire and air? You're more masculine. Do you have a lot of earth and water? You're more feminine. That's it, that's all, it's an elemental breakdown. You can Google that and get that from your birth date. So when you learn to live life balancing those energies, getting that 48 to 52, we have a spiritual principle that's called duality versus unity or dualism versus unity. Dualism is how most of us live. We say one thing, we mean another. We talk, but we don't walk. That's duality, that's imbalance. That's this law in a nutshell. When we actually are walking and talking and saying and living and thinking all the same thing, that's unity. That's where the chakras meet at the sixth chakra, 
that's believed to be the seed of consciousness, that six chakra, those two serpents become one, that's unity. You can only achieve spiritual sort of growth or balance in your life, that 48 to 52 boring, so to speak, with unity, when you're walking the talk, walk and talking the talk. That's the law of gender. So a big goal is to balance those energies that you got at the moment of conception. And gender is seen in absolutely everything. You see it in the yin yang with the, the black dot and the white and the white and the black. Um, we see a lot of the Shiva Shakti principle in Hinduism. It looks like a transgender image. Dionysus in Greek mythology, another transgender image. That imagery is symbolic for the balance of the masculine and the feminine energies that have become extremely distorted in, um, in our world. And then lastly, my absolute favorite is what's called the law of octaves. So my spirit guides say that there's three languages to the universe, math, metaphysics, and music. They all say the same thing. So Tesla, Einstein, Hawking, they all knew the wonders of the universe through math and science. So I study metaphysics, but law of octaves is for the musicians. The law of octaves is the only law in the universe it actually breaks down the moment of conception, your level of consciousness, gives you a step-by-step -step diagram how to transmute to the next octave. And my first book, um, The Seven Gates, Seven Steps Beyond Self-Awareness, those seven steps are actually built on the law of octaves. That's why it works. In my book, I use very common language, child, teenager, adult. The child is the three, first three steps. The law goes do, re, mi, like the musical scale. There is a shock between mi and fa. It's a shift in vibration. It's when we have a thought to change. Then fa, sol, la, ti, do. That fa to ti is the action step, something we actually do in the earthly world. That's the adult. And then when we actually transmute and we own that new behavior change, we're at the next do in the vibrational uh, musical scale. And, and music uh, transcends uh, so much. It's, it's, uh, it's really heaven sent, I think. Well, it is, and it's funny because the last chapter in my latest book, Dethroning Olympus, is about that. I speak specifically to the law of gender. The masculine principle, whether it's viewed as attainment of wealth or sex or courage, um, this sort of masculine energy is what we've always valued. However, full unity only comes through the feminine principle of Venus. And the Venus principle at the high vibration, I'm not talking about image and makeup and, and, and beauty at the superficial level, is actually channeled via the muses and the graces in Greek mythology. And so whether it's music, whether it's theater, whether it's dance, poetry, that is how we see God. Because God in the human realm can only be experienced through the senses. And so we have what's called the clairs, which is clear seeing or clear knowing. That's the guidance of God linked to our senses. But it's through the heaven sent, to use your word, that we actually balance the feminine principle. So if you have too much of a masculine energy, that's exactly how you balance that is through the graces and the muses. When you said the clairs, you mean like clairvoyance, claircognizance, Correct. Sorry, yes. clairaudience, yes. et cetera. Wow, I, there's so much that we could uh, go into. <laughs> I wish like we had several day, more hours. <laughs> I have so much content. And um, I actually just started on my Patreon page, a starter kid spirituality um, to help people get the sort of 12 steps and the basics. I've got a ton of workbooks on my website, drvahia.com. I've got about four books coming out later this year. Um, there's so much, the symbolism, the, the information we we really have so much. My goal is really to help people. We use a lot of terms like soulmates and ascension and fifth dimension, but we don't really understand the origins. So I'm really trying to get people back to the basics to understand what they're doing in the practice that works and then adding the pieces that are perhaps missing so they can really have um, a full blown spiritual practice that helps them grow and use the cycles to their advantages in the laws. Amazing. Well, for sure. Our listeners should go sign up for your Patreon and get some of that great content. Um, how else can they uh, learn from you, uh, work with you? Can they become a client, so, for example, et cetera? 
Yes, so I do do sessions, shadow work sessions, um, Akashic Records, astrology, intuitive, everything. Um, all that's on my website, Dr. Yahia, that's D-R-Y-A-H-I-A.com. Um, my book, The Seven Gates, Seven Steps Beyond Self-Awareness, is really the place to start. It's the individual work. I do have a book coming out for couples and then family systems later this year, but the, the shadow work on yourself is the place to start. And there is a free workbook on my website. I have got about five free workbooks for different things that you want to work with. You can get to these laws and these ways of change and spiritual growth in any way. So I have a couple system. I have a married, uh, a family system, an individual. You can use any of them. I have a YouTube channel with tons of content. I teach at the university and at the university, I post all my videos. And like I said, they're psychology students, but they're really metaphysicians in training. Um, and it, it covers neuroscience, covers symbology, it covers metaphysics, the works. And I also awesome. have a podcast, Mistress of the Subconscious. Awesome. So thank you so much. And thank you, listener. We'll catch you on the next episode. This is your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off. All right. Well, I got to run because uh, Orion's doing a podcast now. So.